Uh, I'm Don Kerwin, and I direct the Center for Migration Studies of New York, which is where you are right now. It's also known as uh, CMS, and CMS, for those who don't know, is a, is a think tank educational institute. It works an awful lot with faith-based institutions, and it's a member of the Scalabrini International Migration Network and was founded by the Scalabrini and Priest about 51 years ago today. So we're delighted today to have with us Elena Segura from um, the Archdiocese of Chicago. She runs the Office of Immigrant Affairs and Immigrate, Immigrate, Immigrant Education, Immigration Affairs and Immigrant Education for the Archdiocese. And uh, she's going to be speaking about this unique parish-based organizing model that she's developed for immigrants with the goal of um, promoting immigrant leadership, uh, securing social justice, and, and, and providing services as well. Um, over, I should just say, kind of our interest in this, I've known Elena for a long time, but institutionally over the last two years, the Center for Migration Studies has sponsored a project that we're calling the Catholic Immigrant Integration Initiative. And what that does is it examines whether Catholic institutions are living up to their history and their promises, immigrant integrating agencies. Are Catholic institutions and also other faith-based institutions, because other communities are interested in this, are they doing for immigrants and their children what they used to do and what many of them were created to do um, and did for past generations of immigrants? We use the word integration to describe the project, but we mean something far broader than integration in kind of a secular sense. We mean empowering immigrants. We mean embracing their contributions and their leadership, promoting their success and their flourishing in the broader society in creating communities uh, between immigrants and with natives based on shared values. So over the past several years, Elena has created this ministry, which accomplishes, to me, pretty much all of those goals. And it's called Pastoral Migratoria. The program is, that is directly focused on immigrant incorporation, immigrant leadership, service, and justice. It addresses priorities in that parish-based communities identify for themselves, whether it's immigration reform or detention or uh, domestic violence or alcoholism or home foreclosures or whatever the case may be. And of course, it's the immigrants themselves who are developing solutions and meeting those needs, drawing on the existing Catholic institutions that again were created kind of for immigrants a long time ago. Um, and all of this work, which I think is very interesting, is under the rubric or viewed as a form of evangelization, which is really, which is correct and accurate and also kind of a very beautiful vision, I think. This is also a transnational project in the sense that um, Pastoral Migratoria is heavily influenced, and I think it's kind of based on the Parasita document that um, then, uh, then Cardinal Bergoglio uh, of, um, of Buenos Aires pushed through, and, and uh, he was actually the chair of the drafting committee, I think, for CELAM, which is the Latin American and Caribbean Bishops Conference. And of course, that's, um, that's Pope Francis now. So we're very hopeful that Pastoral Migratorio can, can benefit other dioceses and faith communities, and that it can be adapted to fit other realities in different parishes and dioceses. I also wanted to um, thank our two respondents today. We're very lucky to have them. Laura Lay Salas um, is the Director of Legal Services for the Diocese of Brooklyn. Um, and she oversees immigration and labor work, housing work, employment legal services for the diocese. Laura Lay joined Catholic Migration Services just this year in January, and she, um, and she describes her work as community-based lawyering and advocacy to increase access to justice for immigrants and refugees. So that's totally fitting kind of with, with our theme, with the work that, um, that Elena does as well. From, 19, from 2012 to 2014, she worked for Make the Road New York. She directed their litigation and supervised the provision of legal services for them. And she has had several management positions at the New York State Department of Labor. Our thanks also to Father Eric Cruz, who's the administrator of St. John's Chrysostom Church in the Bronx, 
I'm the regional coordinator for the Archdiocese of New York's Catholic Charities um, work in the Bronx. Father Cruz works with religious community and civic leaders to facilitate communication and collaboration on behalf of needy families and individuals. He served as a pastor of several parishes and currently serves as a trustee of different charities and healthcare organizations in New York. Um, and before entering this uh, seminary, he worked in the newspaper business as a reporter in South Bend, Indiana, and for the Chicago Tribune newspapers. We have about 90 minutes today. Um, I'm going to ask um, Elena to speak for 25 minutes or so to take some time to present her project. And then going to ask um, Father Cruz and Laura Lane to speak for maybe 10 minutes each. And we're going to try to reserve about half of the time for discussion with you. And then we'll have a little reception afterwards for people that want to stick around and, and talk further about Pastoral Migratoria or about the work that you, you all are doing in your diocese and your communities. So I am going to sit down now and I will be back for the question and answer session and hand it over to Elena. Thank you. Thank you very, very much. Um, it is an honor for me to have the opportunity to be here at CMS when I come to this place or when I come to New York, I feel at home. I really home being in this place. And um, I am very grateful for the opportunity to share about this ministry. And when, when we call about Ministry of Evangelization, it's simply, and I'm, an, I'm, I'm a convert. I became, I became Catholic in 2006, and every time I realize and realize it, it's just simply who we are. When we do evangelization, it's who we are. <laughs> and, I, and you're going to uh, hear more of the story of my own personal experience, how this interacts with who I am, and how this God gave me the opportunity to. To, um, to share this news to all the people in the large part of Chicago, how parties are working. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to start with uh, just to, to share with you what is Pastoral Migratoria, how this was formed, what are the key components, what so, some examples, good examples, and I want to focus specifically in the collaboration uh, areas in the last six or seven months, because there's a lot of things that have been happening. I don't think even God is aware of that even. <laughs> no, there's a lot of great things that are happening. So everything is started really with the U.S. Catholic Conference of Bishops. A lot of people who are connected with the Catholic Church here, you know what it is, USCCB. They launched a campaign called the Catholic Campaign for Immigration Reform in 2005. And that was a very important campaign for the whole country, because it was a very historical time that the bishops uh, were committed to work on, on this issue of immigration. So these are the three uh, goals of the Catholic Campaign for Immigration Reform. Uh, the education, they educate Catholics on the benefits of immigration and immigrants, advocate for immigration reform. And the third was very, it was conditional. If the law will pass, we need to uh, help them in the legalization process. That was very important. But the key thing is education in the third the third. Um, uh, goal. So, uh, just to give you a little background very briefly, um, um, uh, with the Archdiocese of Chicago, Chicago has 352 parishes. Uh, we have 120 parishes with Hispanic congregations, meaning that we have Hispanic masses in Spanish. We have 40 with Polish congregations, Polish, Polish, with Polish masses. And we have presence of uh, Filipinos in 100 congregations, but they, they don't have Tagalog masses. It's very important to mention that but they they have uh, the Simbangabi, which is a Christmas uh, celebration in a hundred churches. Very significant. Mostly the Filipino community is integrated already in the, in the, in the community. So since 2005 to 2007, a lot of dioceses, I think the diocese of, of New York and a lot of dioceses here were, were part of the 80 dioceses were involved in, in trying to reach out to work in the advocacy aspect of immigration reform, right? You probably heard about the marches that came up. Just in Chicago alone, we have more than 200 people, immigrants, who we, we train them and we place them in 180 parishes, non-immigrant congregations, that they were able to share their personal stories in order to be more awareness about the reality of immigrants. And another example, we, we collected 200,000 postcards 
in more than 284 parishes in, in 2005 and, uh, and six. And we form a network, we currently is very, very active, it's a priest for justice for immigrants, so we have around 600 priests, 200 priests, to this, to this very day, very active. And also, that was in 2005. In 2007, we had uh, the Sisters of Rosa Timigas, 59 religious orders, who are very actively involved to this day, also as a part of our network. So this is what, you know, we've been very busy, 2005, 6, and 7, and a lot of you, you also were very involved in, in other things too. Uh, but what happened in 2007? In 2007, the legislation failed, as you know, I love that, that phase, of, is that uh, Senator uh, Kennedy, right? Mm -hmm. It's a very, very meaningful phase for me, I love this phase, because even in 2007, when he was alive, he knew what he meant. I mean, really, we are even living the consequences of this thing to this day. And so, this is 2007. How did it start? We start with that failure of immigration reform. So that immigrant, that failure of immigration reform, we as immigrants, this, this time I'm going to put myself with the immigrant community, and we as immigrants are asking two very specific questions. One, what is that telling us now the immigration reform did not pass? It failed. What is the message? I'm a new Catholic. In 2006, I became Catholic. This is 2007. I'm learning that God is present in everything, everything in this world, in everything that we do. We are very present, vividly present. And this is one of the main, very, very important questions we ask. The other is, what do we, what could we do? To help each other or do we have to wait for um, our american brothers and sisters to do something for us very important question as a response to this question pastoral immigratoria was born and it simply pastoral immigratoria invite immigrants to respond their baptismal call when i say baptismal call now that we just passed easter when we got i was at the easter vigil you know what's the baptismal call very powerful. It's just simply our identity, who we are, who we are. To that baptism to, to, to be engaged in service and justice actions in our parish communities. That's it. No more, no less. It's just very simple. It, 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 it's a call that we, the immigrants, are able to respond. I know this, we have, um, I'm honored to have Father Tim Sack. He is, uh, he was a pastor of, of uh, San John Bosco in Chicago. He's now in, in New York, and I understand why God brought him to New York. So a lot of the members, several people, you can recognize by the team, a lot of uh, these, uh, these, this This part is very meaningful for us because these people are outside the church. They are from the church, but they are outside the church. Can you see the trees, the buildings? <laughs> and this is just a, uh, it was a very, I think this is 2009 or okay, when Things, even the Congress, they didn't want to speak, even Democrats, they, they didn't want to bring the issue of immigration reform. I don't know if you remember, 2009 or 10, I remember very well. We, we, these people were, we did a 40 day fasting and prayer and action, and this is one of them outside, and, and, and it's a beautiful photo that means a lot to me. And really started, I, I want to go back, back to the failure of immigration reform 2005. 2007, remember? I call that the, 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 the time of ashes. And we just finished Lent, right? And the ashes figure, the ashes image is very, very important. But during that time of ashes where we were so depressed, so down, very depleted with energy, but also asking the question, what's happening here? How we, how we, how we, how we gonna live our lives? In 2000, and at the end of 2007, I received this, this is, you can see, this is a parecida, this is a document that the Latin American bishops uh, uh, presented. This version popular is a popular version. That's the reason why I, I read it, because it was, it was uh, actually printed in Peru. That was, the, that was the reason why I decided to read, because I'm from Peru and I read it. I could not believe it when I read it. When I read, I was able to understand but this is the Christianity that God is talking to me. That faith is being lived here and now in our own realities. God is present in everything that we are, we're wearing on, in everything. So Aparicia talks about the, the connection with faith and life. Faith and life. 
how creation is part of our life too. So he talks about these three things, and I know you heard about a sea judge and a, it's basically sea judge and act, but what the way how we put it in Chicago is this listening. Let's listen what's happening around us. We as an immigrant, in our case, you can apply in any reality. But I'm applying exclusively by immigrant community. What is happening in our reality right now? Deportations, remember 2007-8? Deportations, detention, detentions, rates, fear, and all these kind of things that the undocumented immigrants have been experiencing. We need to listen. That is present in that. That's the number one. Second, learning. See that reality that you listen, see that reality from the faith perspective, from the scripture perspective. Look that reality from that faith perspective. What does the scripture say? What does what what's the gospel calling us to see? We can see that reality from that perspective. That's the learning. And third, proclaim. How what do how do we bring the reign of God to that reality? How do we bring the reign of God? When we have deportations, detentions, when we have fear, when people we cannot drive their cars, how do we bring the rain of God? Very important, right? We need to bring, we need to bring real information, protection. People need to protect their families, need to be, need, need, need to go and drive, need to know that they are created at the image of God. And God is protected them, and we are together in this in this thing. Very important methodology that we, we, we use. So this came really from Aparecido. This is 2008. I love the image of, you know, Aparic Apariciones, the apparitions, right? Uh, Lady Guadalupe did an apparition. For me, in the times of fascists, we have an Aparecida, an apparition, an appar apparition. It's, it's, this is the name of the, the town in Brazil. I'm just using that meaning in Spanish for me, and how from ashes we had Aparecida. And this is the policy that we learn. And, I, and it's very important to share with you this specific focus because this is the, this is the fundamental core of this ministry. Because it calls us of who we are. We are sons and daughters of God, simply living as sons and daughters of God in this society. And how, how we can bring the kingdom of God in that in our reality. So the components of pastoral and leaders leadership development, yes, and we're going to talk about that. These are the leaders who really respond. Remember, respond the baptismal call, with service and justice. Respond with accompaniment. Respond with services. Respond with justice actions in their parish community. Those are, and we're going to give more examples of that, this one. There are three stages in pastoral and migratoria. One is formation. Formation is critical. It's very important important in anything that we do. If we don't have formation, well, we need to know who we are, right? That's a very important piece. So we introduce the to the pastoral agents, the pastoral leaders that listen, learn, and proclaim. We accompany new, new pastoral leadership agents to integrate, that's a very important thing, integrate their experiences as immigrants, in this case, as documented immigrants or documented as immigrants in this country, as a faith and pastoral experience. So they are living, seeing the realities from the faith and as pastoral experience, <coughs> integrate and accompany them in making a commitment because this is a commitment. It's not just like, a, oh, you're going to come here and do you get new information and, and, and take it. No, <coughs> it's a commitment, it's a call. And, and we develop, uh, we have some samples for some of you and, and uh, everything, of course, it's in, it's, in, it's in Spanish. And these are samples of these materials. And we uh, use in every single night, I have samples here. We have used a six week session, a formation session, that, uh, that uh, people are, are engaged. And we use the same, the, the, the methodology, listen, learn, and proclaim. And we combine, we also always connect pastoral formation with civic formation. We never do only pastoral formation. Remember, we need to integrate always civic formation. We're talking about reality of immigration. Okay, Real, uh, if, if it's human dignity, domestic violence could be an issue, right? If we're talking about uh, um, right and responsibilities, would be the resources that are available and the, the faithful citizenship. That's another another topic that we need to use. For labor rights, labor organization, labor labor is always connected. A, a pastoral component 
with a silly component. So people could see that they are actually be able to do things and to respond to their reality. These are just examples, and every single every single booklet, which is a formation book, uses the same the same the same uh, uh, methodology. There is a story of an undocumented immigrant, a real story that we collected. This took us two and a half years to develop. And, uh, uh, some theologians, we collected these stories from the immigrant community. I don't know, if, so from St. John Bosco too. I don't know if there were times, this was in 2008 or nine. We collected those stories and then we, we gave those stories to theologians and the theologians help us to articulate and help us to put these things together. And that's how it came. To us two and a half years, but it was a blessing at the end, and we use them in our formation. So the story of undocumented immigrants, the real stories, and then we 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 see this the story of Mary or, 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 or Berta or Senora Garcia. We have the, these stories that are in, in the booklet. Then we read these those stories from the paper text, through the Exodus, through the Catholic social teaching, through Aparecida. We we read those stories, and then how do we proclaim? We bring the reign of God to, uh, the, to very specific things too. So that, that's the, the, and another example is very similar. This has to do with work. We have we have a lot of workers, you know, how being, uh, being abused in the world. Real stories. We read all the stories from the faith perspective, from the scriptures, from Catholic social teaching, and also we proclaim that work of rights, all the kinds of things that related to, to workers are, are being uh, are being applied. So one stage is formation, the six weeks formation. The other stage is commission. In the commissioning, now that these, these, these leaders are being trained and being formed, they are being introduced in the parish community. And the priest is giving them a, a, where uh, they receive a certificate, but also they receive a Bible. And the Bible, that, that little thing that says, God bless you abundantly, uh, is, the, is the youth get a the signature of Cardinal George, now is the signature of, of, of our new Archbishop Sutch. So every single uh, person receives that Bible, which is a, it's a very symbolic thing. This is your truth of your faith, remember? And this is the, this is the core of, of what you're doing. And also, um, let us see, the, the certificate, which is very significant. Uh, the, we institutionalize, in a sense, in Chicago. It took us again this this process another two years to, to get to, to accept. And we're just talking with Father Bruce, and he understands very well what, what what it is. But it was a blessing at the end. So right now, all the priests, every, the priests are. This is not just a, a, an initiative. An initiative. It's not just a little program. It's a ministry. It's a ministry because these people are are responding their calls. I need to be presented to the community. So they are being introduced to the community now. There are these leaders who are going to be responding to uh, the needs of the church community. These are the third, the third stage is implementation. So we have formation, commissioning, implementation. And uh, uh, first, they need to know what are the basic needs, what are the needs of the church community. So people learn how to do focus groups, surveys, how to identify the needs of the community. There are plenty of ways to, to do that. So, they, and one practical thing, the easiest way to do is informational tables. You know, any place in the country, we have thousands and thousands of immigrants coming to our churches. The infrastructure that we have to provide information, to pass information, there, and needs to be organized. So we have informational tables. Or could be workshops. In various topics, it could be labor, immigration, housing, you name it. These are all kinds of topics, workshops, or professional services we can bring to the community. We have clinic counseling, filling in contacts, all kinds of things. That that could be like, these are just examples. And I want to give you examples in 2014, a few of them, 2013. But, uh, in 2014, we had 60 workshops in all those topics, all more, we had 49 driver licenses. We're going to talk a little bit about driver licenses later. And, and also information or referrals, and we have a lot of these, these, these uh, people doing it. We work very closely with Catholic Charities. They, uh, they have a health uh, uh, health care, uh, uh, you know, and also uh, uh, we have at least 20 parishes on a weekly basis providing information on services. That's a minimum that they can do. There's plenty of things to do. In terms of justice, that was in service, now justice. In service, uh, we, we, Pastoral migratory leaders, they collected 50 
50,000 postcards for the driver licenses, and we have a driver license within 2014, beginning 2014. In the last year or so, there were 18 congressional visits, not just with immigrants, but also immigrants and non immigrants, and the immigrant community are the ones who really create, took leadership, and our non immigrant brothers and sisters, and the priests and the kids, all, everybody came up and worked, worked together because there's, there's leadership here and working together as one community. And just the recent thing for, for the Senate proposal of immigration from 2013, right? Was it 2013? Was it also, they collected 100,000 postcards. And, it, and those are real, you know, uh, boxes, I think, that they've been collecting. I love this photo because there are three generations here. This is a, a congressman, a new congressman, and, and, uh, and he was just delighted. He could not believe that such thing exists in the Catholic Church. So he asked this these people to be his consultants. So anything related to immigration, I'm gonna call them, they call them. And these people, these low-income people, who they thought they knew, a lot of people were professionals in, in their countries, and now they are using their skills because they are able to do these kind of things. And now they are consultants. It was fascinating. <laughs> I love that story. Sandra is very good with her grandson. Uh, also in 2014, we, we, we have uh, we, um, uh, we have one anti-immigrant uh, Catholic uh, 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 representative, <laughs> who uh, uh, congressman, who really refused for years and years and years. So uh, the 28 pastors in his district wrote a letter to him. That was one action from the Peace for Justice for Immigrants, and they have they have also collected uh, a lot of these people. Were uh, they did a 40-day fasting and praying uh, action, and the next in winter 2014 was a the most difficult winter in the whole in the, in, 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 in Chicago and they did it because in March, April, May, every single month there was an action that they coordinated. And what in 2014, um, at the end of 2014, also one new thing that's happening, which is beautiful for me, is the, a cluster of parishes, five or six parishes, uh, for these are pastor migratorial south south parishes in the south side, they are the ones who coordinated the whole and accompany children project for the whole archdiocese. So now that's a newest thing that we are we are experiencing. You know, just you know, our office we need we need to do that now no anymore because we have leaders. We we have we are doing other things. Now they can do themselves. And uh, in, in, uh, we have in the Posada the legislative shelter for Posada. That's what we call it. We're knocking the door like uh, Mary and Joseph. So for so many years, the eighth year. But the market area, which has more than five or six parishes, coordinated all these efforts uh, in, the, in, in the last December. Accompaniment is another component, also. These are examples that you can see people not just accompany people in deportation, detention, they accompany when, when workers are discerning information unions, also. That's a very important component of our, of our company. And, and, and they collected that, they, they, they collected 2000, more than 2000. Stuffed animals, and they, I think we share with our children of New York. I think and, uh, 187 children wrote notes for, for, for kids, and, and, and it was powerful. Now, I want to just focus very briefly in the last five minutes I have uh, on collaboration. That's a very important thing, and I think the, one of the reasons why I want to share this with you is that, um, in a sense, why pastor, why immigration reform is not right, is not even right yet. I'm beginning to understand. Before I complain to that, now I, I'm realizing really it's because we, we need time and we need time to prepare ourselves and to mobilize our infrastructure that we have and the richness that we have in, our, in the Catholic Church in order to serve uh, people, especially when we, when we get the third goal of the Catholic Catholic immigration on the legalization process. I think we need that. All this is, is to prepare ourselves for that process. Collaboration with the driver licenses. The, the law, we pass the law, and then the, the, the Secretary of State called call our office and says, uh, uh, You guys, Pastor Migratory, we need help. State Department, the, the Secretary of State is calling our office because they realize that there is an infrastructure here. And they 20% of people who are making appointments for the driver licenses, they are not coming with the proper documentation. In order to make an appointment, you have to wait three months or four months. So they're losing time in waiting and time from work and everything. So they did a train the trainers to the pastoral migratory leaders. 
the third one, Pastor Miratorio leaders, they help them in, in collecting the proper documentation, they help them in preparing their tests because that was another another problem. And then they made they helped them making appointments. They even went to the secretary store with Pastor Miratoria little stamp or something, and they went and they knew that oh my goodness, if it's Pastor Miratoria, these are good people. So they, they save money. They save money because they instead of working ten hours, they all seven hours, that kind of thing. So our people also save time, right? So it benefits the whole community because they are doing this. This is this is our uh, 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 staff from the Secretary of State who came to give the train the trainer. This is uh, Sheriff Kurem, that's another anti-immigrant sheriff in the past. Now he's a he's the fall of our of immigrants now. He he's he, um, he's very supportive and um, he's the one who gives testimony at and Springfield, you know, he passed this law and he's been very helpful. Um, and in just this year, we have a new archbishop, and, and I know the, the pastoral migratoria from the north side parishes are the ones who coordinated these four things, and there were more than 500 people in a single digit uh, temperatures in Chicago, very, very cold, but they were, and, and the archbishop blessed our manual, and our manual just came this year from pastoral migratoria, it took a long time, but I think I, think I, I got one for you, <laughs> and, and uh, so he blessed the, 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 the manuals, and he's very happy with that. Administrator relief, the executive action for my immigration in 2014, up 15, right? Well, that's a very good example. This is the latest, latest uh, slide I'm going to show you, a few of them. Um, we, we have, there are three stages, information, documentation, application. In that case, give the information. People need to know what is this, what's happening. They need to understand exactly what it is so they can make the decision, right? So in, for that, for that, we need we need collaboration with legal service organizations. So we have the American Immigration Lawyers Association, AILA. We have the Catholic Charity. We have a legal service there. The Catholic Legal Immigration Network Clinic is there. We have also the National Immigration Justice Center. But they were known in the Midwest. So we, we got together and we developed a uh, uh, different. Uh, well, I'm going to show you later. I'm going to go to the documentation process. So, so, for the information, the key collaborators are legal service representatives. For documentation, the Consul of Mexico. And, and for the application, we take the training, as you know. So, uh, um, the pastoral migratory leaders, they, they did a train the, later, train the, train the trainers. With, uh, with clinic, they help in uh, scheduling the forms in the parishes. They talk to the police, of course. They promote it in the, in the, in the churches. We did preparations of PowerPoint, because they did the PowerPoint. The forums, and also they help with the distribution of materials, evaluations, and, 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 and um, um, training. And these are just, uh, this, is, this is the train the trainer. We have 160 lay leaders who give to receive training twice, one in December, you know, one in January, because our our uh, uh, project we need to start um, January 15th. And this is the 30 minutes, 30 minutes PowerPoint by Pastor Miratoria training leader, by Pastor Miratoria leaders, and also we have the 30 minutes from uh, immigration attorneys. This, this is a very important thing. Think about undocumented immigrants or immigrants themselves being along with immigration lawyers. Think about what happens in the empowerment aspect. Of it. That was fascinating to see that how these, these leaders and I saw myself, I was amazed at the way how they prepare. They were very well prepared. They took they they took like I think they were cases that they were like three or four uh, um, days of just reading and preparing and very well prepared and and the lawyers were astonished. These are just examples just for you to see. You know all these are the truth. Look at how the, the masses it clearly tells if it's after masses. So if, if it's a two o'clock mass was probably at twelve thirty. That kind of thing. It's just it's after masses. Everything's after masses. Every and, and it's all always in, on Sunday. So we use the infrastructure of the, the truth. Lady, as the leaders are the ones who really took leadership, right? Clergy, they help us in the pulpit. They encourage. They were present in some cases. We use the volunteers. We have space. Parish group is promoted through all the kinds of groups that we have in the churches, and parish staff also help. And now we do the train the trainers for them. These are the results of, of this just in the last in two months. 
We have 35 years participated, more than 2,000 people, more than uh, 23 uh, universal attorneys, and we have 60,000 uh, uh, material that was was that was uh, so submitted. And these are just examples of, of uh, our work with the Council of Mexico. Um, we are working very closely with them with the consular model. This is outside Chicago. In a three-day service, we, we reach out to 740 people, and and, and it, it's, a, it's a collaboration with uh, with the consular of Mexico. Again, trainer trainers is one. The people make an appointment. This was a Saturday, 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 Jornada Sabatines, a Saturday services, and they also help them to collect proper documentation, remind phone calls, and also they went to the to you know assist them in the same the same day. And this is the result of uh, of, uh, of of this work with, with them. We are in, in more than in around 40 Hispanic parishes and we do similar with six Polish parishes also, not just Hispanics, but also in the Polish community. We are we are present. It's evangelization because it really as I said it's just who we are and we we are hopefully this way we are um, bringing a, 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 a assistant uh, leaders, leaders for them, lead, leaders themselves, bring their times and, and talent, but also become uh, positive members of society and, and hopefully be integrated in, in this community. Thank you so much for the time. And later we can go. already overwhelmed us that is so much work that was put into this to be you know to get where you are right with the development of leadership in the community um so just to just briefly go back to what Catholic migration services does is um we work with the basically we're separately incorporated but we provide legal services mostly for residents of Queens and Brooklyn um as for some of the efforts of the group of the to welcome immigrants into, into, into this country. Uh, so 40 years ago, we were created to provide services, specifically immigration legal services in the community. In the most recent 10 years or so, we've expanded to cover other legal services like much needed um, employment law or wage debt, uh, prevention work, and housing um, issues like eviction prevention and helping people access repairs for their homes. These are all issues that are really interconnected, right? Yeah, I think that even if we got immigration reform next year, you can still see that our um, immigrant communities are still plagued with like poverty issues as a result of you know not being able to like earn uh, even the minimum wage, right? So these are communities are mostly affected by um, their employers not complying with the law. As a result of that, they do not pay their rent, which is ever increasing. And so, when we often see a client at Catholic Migration Services, will make they may be coming to us because they're getting evicted, but it turns out that there are all these other issues that they need help with, and we try to do that in a holistic manner. There isn't enough, um, there aren't enough resources to really be able to, to cover all these, to provide all these. Um, representation for the most basic needs that immigrants have, and this is where advocacy and organizing the community really is key, right? The law is there, um, unless it's being complied with, I mean, it's very limited, we, it's a very limited tool, and we see the kind of um, work and passion and dedication that goes into our own um, leaders in the community doing this and pushing for, for change is really what is going to help us feel welcome in this country, right? Um, so just like to react to a couple of the things that, um, that Elena uh, raised in this, um, I mean, we are here what we are today with administrative action because of all of the advocacy and all of the work that was put um, by the community leaders. But this is a moment, it's an opportunity as we prepare to provide services to the community for a relief that is pretty limited for me. Right, to be able to use this moment to encourage more leaders to come to the front and to realize that what we got here was being a you know successful um, um, is a remedy that's going to allow many people to obtain work authorization and to go out there and find their employment and probably feel safer about speaking out about their rights, but it's not a permanent relief. 
right? And this is the moment where we do have um, people realize that only if they get together and they, and, they, and they work hard for these issues, we'll be able to get innovation from them. So it is a moment of collaborating and finding ways to to work with legal services providers, but also uh, the parishes and also the leaders in the parishes. I would love to be able to replicate uh, Pastor Amitra here. I think it takes, um, um, there's a lot of work being done in separate parishes and by very dedicated people, but we have not gotten to this level of organization and collaboration and really making it more of an institution on this side. So it's, um, I'd love to learn more about, you know, how you got here and, and what things maybe you tried and didn't work, you know, learn from the strategies that, um, that were not successful, but ultimately what brought you here today. Um, so um, I think it's also um, an opportunity for us to to think about past, you know, going past um, immigration reform um how do we um involve our parishioners in not just realizing what their rights are right providing education is 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 key in the community but we have a lot of the times in uh, people attending the same church who are both employers and employees right how would you raise the consciousness of those employers who are going sitting down you know at mass with the with, 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 the workers they employ, but who are just not, you know, who are completely violated their labor rights. And so there are there are ways in which we could have more influence and, and, and really help these immigrant communities be more empowered. Um, and there are opportunities that we haven't really taken advantage of yet. Um, most of the, the work that we've done around um, helping communities become more organized is around the housing work that we do. Um, we have attorneys and organizers who work for that with migration services who work with the different parishes in Queens um, to to basically bring know your rights information to, to low income tenants, but also to represent them in court when um, when there's some kind of relief available to them, right? Um, but what the, the real powerful and beautiful uh, work is being done by the tenants themselves, right? So the people who are coming up with those solutions, is what do we do now? How do we make sure that we are able to stay in these communities where we waste our families but we're getting priced out of them, right? Um, and there are different campaigns that our, our tenants are getting involved in, like fighting for, for um, rent regulations reform and to be able to, to get um, um, more caps so that the landlords are not able to base the those rents astronomically. Um, we, you know, we are at the point where our tenants meetings are happening once a month and are led by those tenants themselves. They are the ones who decide who they want to invite to come and do presentations. And it's just that, you know, they're just getting stronger. They're, they're really uh, building a community. And so it's in addition to being part of the same parish, the same church, um, it's also this particular issue that gets them together. Um, this, um, this conversation about um, for, you know collaborating with legal services and, and, and government actors, I think, is really um, is really critical. There is definitely um, there are a lot of options out there for our immigrant communities where they just have this fear of government right now, but there are a lot of places in which they, you know, their rights are still protected regardless of immigration status, right? But people are not really comfortable with coming over to an, a, a government office to file a complaint for unpaid wages, for instance, because they're afraid, right? And um, we're talking earlier about the Bronx being in an area in which, you know, there, isn't, there hasn't been enough work on to address those labor violations. Um, so I think, you know, the parishes and the churches will continue to be able to play a really great role in, in breaking those barriers and making it be like the, the, the neutral and, and the welcoming um, place for immigrants, but also the place where they can obtain like real information on their rights and feel more protected. Right? 
Um, those are my initial reactions. Um, I think I have more questions than anything, but. Thank you very much also. Um, I have a lot of questions too, um, but I hope they can wait for later. In, the, in the, my office in Catholic Charities for the Bronx is two years old. I depend a lot when I accepted this position uh, on what was when I was growing up in the South Bronx, uh, people for change in the 70s. What then became South Bronx churches Industrial Area Foundation, still in existence, went through a valley and hope that I think it's on the rebound peaking again. What was that? And that was empowering and educating parish leaders and pastors and religious as to how to organize. What are your issues, as as Elena had, uh, uh, had alluded to? Learning to organize, learning how to have a meeting and a dialogue uh, even if it's the first one of many, hopefully, with local assembly persons, city council persons, elected officials, uh, local boards, how do you dialogue and how do you stay on task? Because a lot of it is, you know, all of the tools are in our people, are in us, and it's just a matter of bringing them out and the formation that's necessary uh, uh, to help focus and empower and then transform that third step of action, transform that we don't settle, that we always have an eye to the future because the present is always going to change over time. Um, right now, uh, and that's what I've relied on and what I'm doing, I grew up in the South Bronx and I was sharing with Elena when I was first, my first day returning from studies, what's your title is what I was asked by the archdiocese and I said, well, what did you give me as my title? Um, coordinator for the South Bronx. I said, can't be. It can't be. It's all of the Bronx or none of the Bronx. I can't fight the civil war you create. <laughs> okay, because we're church. There's a lot going on in the North Bronx you may not know about that uh, the South Bronx in, in some point of its history is experiencing in terms of migration. In terms, we can jump from homelessness and hunger, we can span it all, but for our purposes, the migration, the residential patterns in neighborhoods that before the bus, buses were not entering because there was no need. So when we talk about organizing and perhaps empowering and overcoming the fear of, 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 of our brothers and sisters from other countries, newly arrived. Well, you know, this area here, the bus stops still three miles away, they walk the rest. Organize them on a, on a simple, rather subtle uh, uh, issue of transportation, bus routes, with the help of locals who now have the same concern. Why isn't the bus coming here? There were more of us living here now. Simple, the bus routes were changed with the help of, of community advocates, the train, the, the formation, if you will, really just empowering and encouraging them to stand up because they have much to offer. They're members of this community. A, a simple victory. So you've tasted, you've tasted a positive step. So you're subtly being empowered in these local issues to come to come out from the shadows, if you will, into the light with others and others who before never would never have been concerned are now concerned in community action. As simple as it is, what's next? And so the dialogue will have started. The dialogue will have started. And thankfully, uh, uh, being able to uh, bring and dismantle walls, and I always go back to that, 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 that illusion. We have to dismantle walls, and, some, and that includes parish walls. That includes telling the pastor, we need you, and we understand you're busy. But we know you have people in your community who can do this, who are hungry for it, They've never been invited. Let's invite them. Let's start talking. Let's start listening to them. 
and let's do let's get together as pastors bring your your local your parish leaders don't forget and i'm going to underscore secretaries as i did previously secretaries of a parish can be so crucial to the work that we do a smiling face who knows what resources are available in a community either from catholic charities or from uh, the immigration office services or another office and can give a referral and the right contact information it goes a long way as opposed to he's not here right now you're going to have to come back well you know they're not coming back most likely so the secretaries they've been part of the formation process that we started to do in the south Bronx, and that was happening in the upper counties i'm not creating anything new but they're so essential the simple things make a big difference right the foundation is so crucial and they they're the triage before they get to me as a pastor at st john's the person's turned off i'm not going to see them and i may never know they entered through those doors and it's the same at my office the capitaries we go over this so it's so essential that we don't take for granted the simplest most fundamental contact with whomever comes in need asking for assistance language or otherwise not being a barrier not being a barrier uh, i have the advantage of recognizing the elephant in the room of wearing this collar so and being raised in the south bronx and being a pastor having a relationship with clergy there and outside of that um, but the, the the contact with the pastor or, or or and a referral from him for volunteers for invitations to invite them to forums to really speak in dialogue with them this is what we're not like you know i'd like to get to know you better are you some nut no you know who are you calling why are you calling now the dialogue begins we start to dismantle the barriers and overcome the fears right you know there's a we try, we try to work uh, uh, when it comes to our parishes on the on the, on the four converts uh, uh, people who are, are are there filling bags at, at the pantry and giving them out but they're not involved in the civic aspect of the ministry and vice versa those who are very involved in the civic but don't have a personal contact with those they're helping and that's a heck of a way to break down those barriers you know people will love to love to give the catholic charities thank you for your money i'm not going to say no but i could really use you i can really use you these people come and see the difference that you're making and, and, and inviting the parish groups and, and, and the confirmation groups or religious education program. Because we start the formation at a young age. We don't have to wait till they're 18 to begin the formation of being part of this parish collaborative network. We start forming our leaders through the works of mercy and confirmation class. We're putting a face to what they're learning in textbooks. We're taking them out to fix houses to go to these daycare centers, to be our foot soldiers when it's time to collect documents, to do the outreach for the follow-up once executive action is, 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 over, is, is approved and will go forward, along with the local universities. Being a media person, I try to pay back my brothers and sisters in the media. Uh, is, you know, let's reform the media. Let's talk about how you can serve these people by coverage, by coming to our uh, information events. Now, a few of them may want to speak with you, and these people need to hear their stories, and we need to hear them too, because they enliven us and give us and keep feeding the mission. Keep feeding the mission. I'm at this new parish, and I and I told the Archbishop and, and my superiors, I would love to have Catholic charity parishes with offices there and, 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 and each unique to the mission of the church, vis-a-vis -vis Catholic charities. 
immigration services, whatever is needed in those areas, with using the schools and enlivening the body of Christ. I love the the, the, migratoria, the migration. The church is on a, a pilgrimage. We're walking towards something together. Now, I think it's a wonderful title uh, and name for that office. From that's what that's the image I see: the church walking. The body of the church is walking, the body of the church is speaking. They might stumble, but they're going to get up and keep going. And we'll keep dialoguing, hearing and listening and being fed all together. Now, I have a lot more questions. I'll stop with that. Thank you. very powerful and I don't want to stop the dialogue but let me just a few things that I thought were particularly powerful that idea of commissioning I thought Elena was extremely powerful where people go off not as they don't uh, they, they're going off basically as ministers as leaders you know, and, and that kind of formalizes that I really, I really found that powerful and then Laura Lay this issue of and we see this kind of on a national level too how do we how do we create one church you know if we could if we could Deal with the employers and deal with the laborers too in the same way, and they can really see that they're co-religionists and really kind of work that. We, I think, I think about that with immigration and reform nationally as well. You know, if only the Catholic politicians out there, we don't even want them to be on our side if they could just stop saying negative things about immigrants, stop criminalizing, them. and they, but yet, and yet they don't see immigrants as their co-religionists, as, as, as members of their community. And uh, and Father Cruz. This idea of pastors comes up all the time. You know? Pastors who feel, um, when they're approached for something like this, that it's another burden on them. That they're already overwhelmed. Who's going to do this work? We can't do it. You know, and and that they're actually not being asked to do it. They're being asked to facilitate it and support it. But there's a whole community there that's got gifts and can contribute. So I mean, those are those are kind of three things that resonated with me. And I wonder if you want to respond to any of that or elaborate on any or ask each other questions however you want to do it and then we'll open it up to the group. I mean for me I think one thing is that we have this potential now to be able to assist like thousands of people with executive action hopefully will happen. Um, and I think you know I think in meetings with um in New York just trying to like work with like several types of different issues and, and, and be able to provide the right information, right? Make sure our, our communities are not going to be defrauded or pay thousands of dollars for something that they're not eligible for, right? But the question is, how do we provide these services when we really don't have any money to like hire most people? And, and this is where the volunteers that are paying leaders are, you know, coming to play, right? And how do we get, you know, in, in a place where we are not yet organized, I think I, I feel Hopefully we'll, we'll be there, you know, a little closer to that in a couple of months, three months, but we are going to be relying on, on these volunteers to help other people, you know, obtain uh, immigration relief. And that, that's just critical. It's something that um, I think we can really work hard on in the next few weeks. One of the things that I found in the time of Easter Relief, um, when, I, when I mentioned to you how the empowerment aspect of the uh, being able to provide information to the community. And these are people who, you know, some of them are documented, some of them are documented, just being together with an immigration law, lawyer. Uh, that has been very powerful. But also, I think what I notice is that great opportunity that they have in order to give the time and talents. So the church is simply giving them the opportunity to have. So when you say we need, we have the way how I see the church, the church has to be. Plenty of volunteers ready to be able to give time and have time and time. I mean, you're talking about how the church does an office of church, the church is like many times. Those are the, the walls uh, when we talk about the walls. But uh, even with that, I think what I, I've been doing this for 30 years, and, and I've been doing immigration work for 30 years in the US, in the Algebra Chicago, 15 years, and I was not Catholic until six years after I became I became that. One thing I've done, I went to, I, I, that time I met, met you, funny thing, I think. I visited every single parish of 365 again, the relationships. And I believe that 
yes, there is, there is opportunities about how to style, what to do. That was, to me, <laughs> my, my daddy inspired me. El campo está blanco. El campo está listo. The field is ready. Oh, I see it. I see the whole is ready. It's just are we giving the opportunity for them to come and give them? And there is a, there is a whole. Uh, I, that's how I see the baptism in court. That's how I see. I don't, uh, you know, the church is here simply giving the blessing for for, for immigrants to give themselves to be. Uh, to bring their gifts to this country. In addition to the faith, because the faith is the most amazing thing I can see for myself. If I, mean, if I became Catholic, I, I, I became as a result of the witness that I see a lot of these people before they have to see how I have There's so many doors to enter into, I think, that even we don't, we haven't certainly exhausted the different channels. Um, I speak of pastors, you know, you have parishes who aren't involved in social ministry, probably, maybe a food pantry. Then you have others that are a little much more organized. They have a, a structure in place, the religious sisters or brothers, the numerous parish, or if you're a religious order, you have certain resources or perhaps relationships that are not unique, that are not unique to like a diocesan parish. So the dynamics vary, of course, but I think across the board, if you ever walk into and have a meeting with the priest that most likely uh, uh, doesn't have his overburden, you're emphasizing the first thing, I know you're busy. But you, you know, you have a parish council, you have these parish groups, you have leaders here, you have heads of your ministries here. Um, what would be the one or two things? I'm discussing this with, I met with Father at this other parish. He in this area says this. Now you're no longer isolated as a priest in your mind. And I've had to do this, even with the guys I've known for years. I can push it a little harder, but you're not alone. We're just asking for your blessing. We'll keep you informed. Who do you desert? Who would you desert? Just think about it. We're not asking for answers now. You know, from housing, South Bronx Church is very heavily into housing uh, in recent times. That's a major issue in the South Bronx. Uh, uh, he's slowly being uh, overcome by uh, working families or working poor really bounced back and increased again. But the dialogue with, with, with the religious or the pastor who appears over well, he's just having a bad day. Okay, that dynamic, how do you diffuse that and offer to do the work? This is what I believe even the plan in his hands. These are the first set of meetings with the people you discuss over six weeks. People you suggest or recommend. What's the, that little retreat like about social ministry? Maybe it's teaching them finally, for the first time they'll hear about the church's social justice teaching and how that relates to their own immigrant experience and their families, perhaps. But I think of Mary Felice and God rest her soul, who was the bridge between the, the Puerto Rican, the Dominican, and the Irish who were already there. She was, you know, a lot of our, those folks did this type of work on their own. They were bridge builders, you know, and, and thanks be to God, my mom was part of that in the, in, just after the war in Spanish Harlem. So sometimes we just need to re be reminded that we're not alone in our, we're all tired, we're all exhausted. And thank God I'm so refreshed by listening to well, Elena and, and, and Lorelai here. Um, uh, and that's so essential that when you're walking into a meeting with, with a priest or anyone like that. and Maybe the hardest part you're going to have is getting the meeting. Is getting on the book and the schedule. I'm going to perseverance, you know, and even you will need a break. I'll call him in two weeks and I'll get back to him. Okay. You have to, the, the, the consoler needs to be consoled as well. The foot soldiers need to rest. You need to rest also. Yeah. And 
keep recharging the, the, your soul and your energies. So questions or comments, please? Um, you could identify yourself. Sure. Hi. Karen Mackey on IDEA. They're working on how many Chinese immigrants services for the Diocese of Barcelona and Long Island. Um, when you talk about the priest, uh, um, in many of our immigrant communities, um, the direct contact with the community, with the immigrant community, are not the pastors, are, are the, um, the priests who can speak the language, or many of them are foreign priests, right? They are externs. Um, so they are here basically to, to get the mass in, in the language, and then you finish that mass, you run to the next parish, and that's all they do is, is, is give mass and run to the next parish for the whole weekend, right? So you cannot really count on them to to help you or to be that bridge builder. Uh, and then comes the um, the difficulty of trying to get the pastor to help us respond to that thing. Sure, we can go to the parish, we can go to the parish social ministry office. Uh, but most people do not even understand that process. They go to the rectory, right? And we're trying to say, don't go to the rectory, it comes three all away. But it's taking that into consideration, and I don't know if that's the same way uh, in the Bronx, but we do, when it comes to the immigrant uh, community of who's the leader um, within that language or within that, that particular group, is that foreign priest who has no sense of the immigration experience in the United States. They themselves might be here temporarily, but most of them do not really understand because they are here for such a short time, you know, one to three years and they can move to, you know, wherever they are. To that so it's just trying to understand that point of what would be the best way to approach it uh, facing the system. That's, 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 a, that's a challenge even with immigrant priests who are stationed in the parish for six years because their pastoral style might be different than, than what we may be accustomed to here. Uh, so that's a subtle uh, challenge, you know, the pastoral approach and the dynamic in your own parish. Um, one avenue that we've taken is collaboration with other agencies. Let's take Arch Care, which is the medical arm of the Archdiocese of New York. There's a staff person working uh, in my office. Uh, under Catholic Charities, but he's employed by Arch Care. Um, so he does outreach and talking about both services. This is where we talk about the, 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 the crossing over of services. It's never one thing. So in his outreach for, uh, uh, let's say, the PACE program for senior citizens, Medicaid, Medicare, the kids need bills aren't being paid. So the referral will come, and this is an immigrant couple I think of. He has, he, he's bedridden with cancer. His wife is, is now pro progressing with dementia. Okay, rent's not being paid. Outrageous rent that they, that they were, uh, uh, that they were dragged into by an unknowing relatives. Um, so the outreach was through Arch Care. Came through Catholic Charities as well. Um, and went to the pastor of the parish to let him know what was happening. Okay, not U.S. born from another, from actually from Mexico. Um, and we talked quite a bit. And he was like, "Wow!" Now he sees what's happening. So what? What? What I? What I? What I'm suggesting is that. If other collaborations are possible in the immigration sphere, domestic violence, you know that's a major issue, right? The employment, the high wage issues. Who else do we, with whom do we collaborate? And now we have access to that pastor through those agencies or organizations. Okay, that's a response to a particular issue dealing with pastors who may be, and I, and I always go back to the pastors because the, the guys who come in, celebrate mass, it's fluid. It's fluid. And it's key to get to the pastor. 
guys who were there. And we're in a changing environment in the church, right? With consolidations and things, we were aware of it. But that doesn't prevent us from still going to the administrator of the parish. Uh, perhaps through a collaborative relationship with another agency. So maybe someone you're in collaboration with now that we may not think about at this moment as being beneficial to bridging that gap. You know, organizations that you can get the pastors together in a particular neighborhood. We know this is the issue there. Well, Father's one, this is the date we're having this. You're invited. Free lunch. Uh, you know, there'll be a reception afterwards to follow. Bring your and bring your secretaries and volunteers who are involved in this. I think we'd be surprised how many would come to that. I was shocked. And I'm a I'm oh, I think I'm an eternal optimist. But I was shocked how many came. I really was. There were twenty two parishes and one nineteen came with their secretaries. And we spent the day together. And it gives them an opportunity to hear what you do, not just the issue. And it's now all of a sudden they're getting the full picture. They're getting the full picture. If you can get groups of priests together, we are better off in many circumstances than trying to get an individual. Okay. Um, hi, I'm Will Coley. I'm a, I guess I'm a digital media strategist with a bunch of different immigrant rights groups. But um, I had a question about what you were talking about about the claiming and about dismantling down, dismantling walls within parishes. I'm just curious how immigrant lay leaders can be can help change the hearts and minds of other non-immigrant Catholics, and if they're able to, if there's opportunities for them to speak to, you know, non-immigrant communities within other Catholic parish, parishes. And I'm asking because I'm curious about like resources that they might need. Um, I'm working on a project now with, um, it's based with a bunch of films and discussion guides, and we're wondering how to get that into the hands of. Uh, you know, non-immigrant churches that could use as a way to talk about immigration to kind of, I mean, because the people that are voting for these these con congressional representatives, you know, some of them are Catholic too, or we'll say. So I'm just curious if there's opportunities for immigrants to be leading that discussion with non-immigrants or if there are things that we could be doing as far as getting resources to them to help them have those discussions, or if we need to come at the other way and, and change their hearts in some way in order for them to have those discussions with immigrants. Yeah, what, what's happening in Chicago is um, we do have a, a whole network called um, you know, 127 non immigrant communities. We have immigration peers coordinators. These are people who are not immigrants who are being work together with Pastoral Migratoria. And uh, this is just uh, this happened in the last two years. They're the IPCs, we call them, immigration peers coordinators. Uh, they are the ones who develop all kinds of educational, uh, uh, you know, activities in the parish. They invite speakers, or they can invite you know, their participant advocacy, those kind of things. But the newest thing is we're, we're having this we call uh, the peace circles. So in peace circles, you have people who are immigrants and non-immigrants, and, and this is very new. This is when I said show you the, what's happening in the company children in the summer. Um, that was when, when we started developing this kind of dialogue. So small groups of people, immigrants and non-immigrants, are beginning to know each other. Number one, they really know each other, they really know them as, as individuals, as persons, not as immigrant, no immigrant. In the past, we, we, we don't like to use immigrant, no immigrant, actually. But it, it is happening. So um, uh, uh, they, that's how they organize uh, um, Congressional visits. I don't know if you saw the slide that there were 80 congressional visits, and they were, the ones who were really the ones who coordinated were immigrants, but they put a, put a non immigrant presence because that was very, very important. You know, and also the business community was very present, and, and, and other faith communities we were able to invite in some cases too. So that is beginning to happen in, in, uh, in the last year or so. Um, so we do a lot of work. We do immersion experiences. Um, uh, we, uh, we we have a detention center in Chicago. So every single Friday at 7:15 there is a mass and it's a, a prayer vigil. So uh, we have one we have one person, one consultant who works for us, and she did a all reach out all the Catholic high schools and all campus ministries 
and we have a whole directory now, and she's organizing immersion programs for one day, Fridays, for, you know, 7 in the morning to 7 p.m., and that includes the visits to the, to the detention center, then go to the uh, uh, day, day, day labor corner, because we have day labor corners, and then go to a, a mass in Spanish, or the, the shrine, and go to a pastoral migratoria parish. They finish at a pastoral migratoria parish, and they do the dialogue. So there are 60 students who are going to be doing uh, in November, uh, in the south, June or something. So we have already some some programs. So all we've been doing this for a long time, but these are the newest things working with you. Sir, can I, what ages? Like, when do you start? High school. High school. All mm -hmm. these immersion programs are high school. This for high school. Exclusively high school, and this is very new. This is 2015. This year, uh, we just hired this consultant, and she came with this idea. And we were amazed how they are responding to immersion programs because it again it gives you a personal experience. You know, you know, they go on and, 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 and see it, come and see. It. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. If you would be in Chicago, you know, if you would be in Chicago, we have my monthly forums. All pastor and the all the four pair forty four parishes come every two months to a forum. We invite we would invite you to one of the forums. We have always two organizations coming to do a presentation with all the resources. So instead of you going to four or sixty parishes, you go to one forum and you 10,000, 15,000, whatever the amount of material that comes to the post through the net. I'm not in Chicago, I'm not in Chicago, I can send you some ideas. Yeah. So, I've worked for government for for both the UN and the New York State Department of Labor, and I think. I think people know, people advocates for workers' rights know that the agency is available, know that um, you know, people have rights in, in their workplaces regardless of status, and that's the information that's passed along to the community. I think it's more about the practical barriers oftentimes, right? Because I mean, I've been in that place where it's, it's much more difficult sometimes to be accessible to the immigrant community when they need that access, right, which is like weekends and evenings. And, um, and only, I mean, we find it as advocates to work, you know, people don't leave you a message. They don't want to leave a message in a voicemail. They want to connect with someone, right? And so recognizing that that the, 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 the human kind of contact thing that is what's going to like help them feel more welcome, or that there isn't just a machine or just some like rhetoric about like being accessible, but they're not. And it's hard, it's hard to break those walls down when you want to be like large agencies, right? Even state agencies. Um, so I, I, there's that and there's also the fact of like the oftentimes now speaking of the app, being an advocate, um, you know, being able to actually talk to someone, let's say like we help people fill out complaints for the U.S. Department of Labor, the New York State Department of Labor, but oftentimes even just having access to the investigator who is working on the case and, you know, I think there's a lot of training that still needs to happen within the staff at the agencies as to what they can and cannot say. Oftentimes you get people who, who the point say, well, I can't talk to you about this case. But there are some things that you can say as an agency, and there are some ways in which you can explain things to the applicants so people don't feel frustrated with that, right? Um, but I think I think there's much more in New York, there's much more awareness that we have rights in the workplace, it's more that access issue and I don't know that's more of a, a bigger practical question for the agency to address and how do I make myself more available to, to this community when they need it. The only speaking only 
for the Bronx, maybe the archdiocese at large, we would be able, more than happy to facilitate a forum. If it's about to disseminate information, we have, you know, we have the highest concentration of Catholic charity agencies in the Bronx, for the, in the 10 counties of the archdiocese. Um, and almost all of the 30 agencies have programs and services. They're all within an 18 by 18 block area of the South Bronx. So we use our agencies to disseminate information if there's a forum coming. We'll use our past pa parishes to get the word out to the pastors to put in their bulletins. This is the night, this is the location. Look, we could facilitate an evening, several evenings spread out for the, for the Bronx. And I'd be more than happy to, to work in other parts of the Archdiocese to help facilitate that. Um, uh, getting, sending, a, a, if it's a matter of sending actual correspondence to a, involve everyone in the Archdiocese of New York, which is in 10 counties, we have an office downtown, you give it to them and it's sent in a, in a greater package and up to three months in advance or four months in advance. You know, the word will get out. But if you want a focus area, if that takes the South Bronx or the Northwest Bronx or Westchester County, whatever your scope is, we would help, we would work to facilitate. We found the evening forums to be very successful and very well attended. That you have two hours and depending who's there and, and once Pandora's box is open, you may have you might have another two hours of just discussions after the fact, one on one or groups. Thank you, Okay. One more? Yes, yes um, Elena, thank you for your work. I just uh, had a question in terms of I know it's a diocesan uh, led program. Um, how are you funded? How does this program, who funds this who program? Funds program? Yeah. Um, um, around 70% 70, uh, 70 of the funding comes from uh, outside the archdiocese and the 30% comes from the archdiocese. And is that, in is that by way of grant writing or? Well, well, mostly religious orders. Religious orders were the first, we think, the ones who are really the ones who support and believe as well. And that's so it's 70% come from outside the diocese. Yeah. So this is from the Catholic Foundation. Fundraising, I have one fundraising and then two of the some examples here. We have a business community helping us on some people. We have a lot of sponsors. We have an event with our Archbishop coming up in May. And we're very delighted with you know, the many 30, 40 uh, just businesses, the law firms, and all that kind of group because they know they are seeing that this is what we and is there a separate a group at the diocese that's responsible for development then for this program no, or myself. it's your responsibility and you have like 100 people working for you right <laughs> <laughs> how many people in your office we have uh four full-time people working in our office we have like 10 part-time people so it's grown. <laughs> That's good to hear. Elena, any final word? Yeah. Um, the interesting thing about the part time people, are many of them are lay leaders who receive a small wage to continue and deepen the, or the organizing and the ministry in the regions. Because, as you like, like New York, the Chicago Archdiocese is quite expansive and distance and, and variation of needs from more suburban to more like small town to more the, the center city of Chicago. So um, the, those people don't work a huge number of hours, maybe uh, seven hours a week or 15 hours. But it's, um, and it's also a way to support them in with wages to help mm -hmm. them uh, you know, foster this, but as well as the system and their own livelihood. Yeah, the last word thing is that um, uh, we are in the process of, of exploring, and actually Kathy is our, our consultant, uh, and uh, in 
how could we take this model to other places in the country? I really don't know. It seems like God is opening doors, and I'm a little scared. <laughs> I feel like uh, Mary, the story yesterday, the story Mary grew up in the, in the, in the, in the close of Jesus, and, and Jesus saying, "Take it and go, go." <laughs> I feel like that. But uh, I, we are in the process of exploring how we could we take this ministry. I do believe, and because I witness a lot of great things, it can't be only in Chicago. Has to be in other places. And how to how to take to other places? That's the question. That's what we're here. That's why we're in dialogue. We're talking with Ron. That has been a very. We have finally we have our our our, um, our manual. We have the foundation of materials, and we have a lot. We have all these materials. Please feel free to take uh, in Spanish and English. It's the latest. We just updated yesterday because we're so busy doing a lot of work, and as a result of coming here. We were able to update some numbers, and I was astonished to know the amazing work that these people are doing. I just couldn't believe myself, just couldn't believe it. But that's where we are right now in that process, and, and uh, we'll see how, where, where things are going for us. It was very important. I, I, I believe that there is plenty of people ready to do what we have, and, and, uh, and I hope well, we will be able to facilitate somehow to start other places. It's amazing. Somebody was telling me, Elena looks like the elephant is, it was kind of sleeping. Or it, and now, now the elephant is having that, and a lot of people are afraid of some people are coming. Uh, you cannot, in a weekly basis, I have large organizations calling me, knocking them, emailing me, because they know that there is something going on. For me, that's evangelization. Even the uh, uh, Consul of Mexico, uh, it took them for a lot for them to invite us to work with them in a consular office. They observe us for three or four years and they realize that this is a good, trustable, we prepare a totally clean, clear, transparent, Indian service of compassion and information. And now we can reach out to 150,000, 200,000 as a result. Well, thank you, all three of you. We really appreciate you being here and leaving, especially.